Welcome back to another episode of Harmonious at Lunch, the show that fuels your business success. I'm Brandon Gano, your host and guide through the world of harmonious business growth. Today, we're unlocking powerful strategies with industry experts to help your business thrive. If you're a business owner, entrepreneur, or executive, you are in the right place. Join me and our incredible guest today on the journey to clarity, growth, and success. It is time to revolutionize your approach to business. Let's dive in with another episode of Harmonious at Lunch. Welcome back to another episode. We got some more bite-sized business advice today. And one of my favorite episode styles is always the one we have lined up today. It is the success story or the journey story, if you will, of a successful entrepreneur. And we're going to hear behind the scenes what it takes to grow a company in an industry that he wasn't familiar with at the beginning. And I think that's even cooler. So the bumps along the road, the lessons, the learnings, all those beautiful things. I have Brian Clayton with me, founder and CEO of Green Pal. And Brian, before we go any further, welcome to the show. Thanks for being here. Hey, what's up, Brandon? Thanks for having me on, man. It's great to be here. I, I'm excited about this because it's, uh, so full disclosure, I haven't heard of your company before we met here. And it's one of the coolest ideas I think I've ever heard from, heard of, because you're you're disrupting an industry you're, and you're also making an industry easier to access for the customer and the service provider. So give me, in your words, give me the background of what is GreenPal. Yeah, so GreenPal is a marketplace. It's an online app that works like DoorDash or Instacart uh, or Uber, but for lawn care services. So if you have a rent or own a home and you have a yard, you need to get somebody to mow the yard for you. Rather than calling around on Facebook or Craigslist or something like that, you just download GreenPal, you pop your address in, someone comes out and takes care of the lawn for you. And GreenPal is a 10-year overnight success. My two co-founders and I have been at this for a little over a decade, now around 300,000 people using the app to get lawn mowing services done on a weekly basis. And before I started GreenPal, I actually had a landscaping business. I started mowing grass when I was a teenager in high school and little by little grew that into a large landscaping company with about 150 employees ultimately and and uh, and sold it uh, about year 15 and after I sold uh, that business I took about a year off and decided eh, what am I gonna do now and I thought well maybe I'll build a marketplace that works like uber does because at the time uber was just getting rolling and uh, and uber was kind of the inspiration for for how green Pal would work and used what they were doing for ride sharing and applied it for this industry that I knew, lawn mowing. And uh, the challenging part was was executing on the technology side of it, executing on the on the marketplace side of it. But uh, little by little, just through trial and error and going from one failure to the next, we, we kind of figured out how to build a marketplace that would that would satisfy buyers and sellers and make it easier to transact with our platform than than it was the, the old way. And and uh, now, now we're a decade in, and it's still very much day one. We want to get to a million people using it, but we're finally, we finally have something that that works that people that people get 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 value from. Yeah, I love that story, and I think it, you make it sound so easy. But both both of your accomplishments here with these two separate businesses are not common. I mean, uh, if you look at the traditional landscaping company, I would say, and you probably know better than me, but eighty percent of landscaping companies are one or two guys with a mower and a weed whacker. Like yeah. to have yeah. 150 employees and, and scale to multiple millions in revenue, that's that's uncommon. So I want to go back there for a minute. Like you obviously that was not an overnight success either. What are some of the things that you learned along that journey before you sold the company? Yeah, landscaping business is a awesome business to get started in to kind of cut your teeth on what it means to run a small business because you can learn 80% of what goes into running any kind of business uh, in a service-based business like that. So things like bookkeeping and customer service and marketing and just business 101 and what goes into pulling a business together, you can learn in the landscaping business. And that's one of the beautiful things about it. And you can keep it small and profitable. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, you can keep it just you or you and a helper or you and two or three people. I know a lot of blue collar millionaires that did just that, that, that kept their little landscaping business really lean and mean and tight. And they invested in real estate and things like that. And they, they retired at, uh, at 40. And so that, that's, that's a path to success. You don't have to grow a big company in that industry uh, to be successful in it. 
but I had a chip on my shoulder uh, in the early days of running that business. I really wanted to build a big company in the industry. For some reason, I just felt like uh, I could build an industry leading business in my in my market. And and so I set out to do that and I made a little business plan to do that. And and uh, some of the things I learned along the way, maybe about year four, five or six, was that I wasn't in the landscaping business at all. I was actually in the sales business and I had to figure out a way to to architect a sales engine at the core of what my my business was, that the landscaping was kind of just table stakes, that the really what what our what what our driver of success was was prospecting and, and connecting our customers with the value that, that we delivered. It took a while to figure that out. It took a while to, to design and execute on that process. But once I figured that out and got the people kind of in the right roles and, and got that humming, that was I able to take the business from like a million in revenue to three to four to five, ultimately $10 million a year in revenue, and then, and then get it to a point where a national company would want to acquire it. Uh, it took, took a lot of trial and error there. And and when I sold the business, I thought, okay, here I am. I just built and sold, sold an eight-figure contracting business. I, I know everything there is to know about about uh, about business success. And then I was quickly humbled when I started GreenPal. I realized you don't know the first thing about this type of business. And it was uh, even though I was a second-time founder, I was very much a first-time founder all over again starting GreenPal. There were so many things I had to learn all over again. Yeah, there were there were some common denominators. Some some lessons did carry over. But most everything I had to learn all over again. So it was kind of like a very humbling experience. It was exactly what I needed at the time. Uh, but I think if you're throwing everything you have into a business, you should evolve into an entirely new person every year or two. And that was one of the things I noticed about the first company and definitely one of the things I noticed about the second company, Green Pal. Uh, I, was, I was evolving into a whole new person every year or two. And that's one of the things I love about it. Yeah, that that's actually a really interesting point. I wanted to touch on that because so we we typically work with uh, our clients are seven, eight figure businesses. They have a team. They have a bunch of employees, five to 50 ish employees when we start working with them. And the one commonality we always find is that the the owner, founder, CEO, whatever you want to call them, is the bottleneck to the business. Yeah. And they've gotten them to they've gotten themselves to a point where, you know, they've grown to, let's say, one, two, three, four million but they're still in the way of, of making decisions. So when you say you have to reinvent yourself or, or learn new skills, how soon did you figure out that, okay, I've, I've gotten this thing to, let's say, upper six figures, low seven figures in revenue. I, I need to be in a different role. And I also need to build systems and put other people in the right roles. Like, what was that process like for you? And then what are the things you did to reinvent yourself at that time? Yeah, I, there's never been a situation where, where uh, I was in the way and I had to get out of the way and put somebody else in the way, in the role. It was a situation where I was underdeveloped and I needed to develop, learn, execute at a higher level, develop the process and put somebody in the process. Hmm. And so, and so what I, what I mean by that, so, so it's, it's kind of a fallacy and, and, and I think kind of like almost like a wish of small business owners of, oh, well, um, I just need to like hire the right people. And then I'll just magically, like they will carry me to success. And that never happens. Like- Show me the path, please. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> like that, that never happens because because like that, they, that, that those type of people are going to not want to come work for you they're they're, they're not going they're going to be able to understand they're not going to want to work for somebody less talented than them um and so so you as the founder have to develop yourself to a higher level and then 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 you attract those type of people who can execute your system your vision uh at a very specific level that that you kind of set them on um and so and so what i mean by that is in the first business, like I, it wasn't like I just hired a rock star salesperson and they just took the sales process and ran with it. No, it was I beat my head against the wall and figured out what our sales process was and learned and developed my sales skills and and learned and developed what our value proposition was. And then I was able to go find uh, somebody who I knew was good at sales. I taught them the industry and I plugged them into my system that I built. And it wasn't until I developed those skills from within was I able to then do that 
And then I could focus on operations and other things and kind of rinse and repeat and do that over here. Same thing with, with GreenPal. Uh, I tried when we first started. I didn't know how to build software. I didn't know how to code. I didn't know how to, I didn't know how to develop software. And so I tried to, to hire somebody to do that. And same thing, it was, a, it, was a, it was a big failure because I didn't know what to expect. I didn't get the best. Uh, they, they saw that, that I was a layman and they took advantage of that. And, and so I had to go back to the drawing board, go to YouTube University, learn how to become a halfway decent engineer and, and then kind of like build the first version myself, my co-founder and I. And then we could then attract good quality developers and engineers to work around us and, and build it from the ground up that way. So I think, I think anytime you try, you're trying to build out a team and you're trying to delegate from a position of abdication, meaning I don't know how to do this. You take it, run with it, and go get successful with it. I think that's always going to blow up in your face. I think you have to delegate from a, st a standpoint of stewardship, which is here, here's, here's how I want you to do this. Here's what I expect. Here's what success looks like. Here's how I once did something similar or how I once did it. Um, here, here's how long we think it should take. Um, and here's how we gauge success. Now you go do it. I think that's a much better uh, position to 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 have have success to delegate somebody with. Now, now, yeah, there's examples like, you know, I just got done uh, watch, you know, watching the the, the shoe dog movie uh, about Nike and Michael Jordan. And you look at like how much faith uh, Phil Knight put in Matt Damon's character to make that deal happen. And I'm sitting there watching like, damn, I wish I had my Matt Damon. You know, that'd be awesome to have somebody go, 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 go get run a deal like that for me. I think a lot of that was probably like glamorized, you know, it probably wasn't like that, you know? Uh, so you have to be careful with like these, these mythological stories that you hear. Um, and so, and, and, and so just the, the, the allure and the myth that you're just, you're just going to like hire your way to, to ultimate success, especially at the, at the small business level. Um, no, you, you as the founder have to execute, and develop the system, you have to grow and then you have to plug people into that system. Yeah, that, that's such a good tip too. And I, I think the one thing that's ruined most movies for me is as soon as it's over, I Google like the real story. Yeah. It says like based on true events, I'll Google what was the real story of the Michael Jordan movie or the Nike movie? And then you're like, oh, that was all a lie. There was like 1% of it that was true. Yeah, <laughs> but yeah. What I love is this conversation is real it's raw you can hear actual stories of what what takes place i agree with everything you said i mean you you can't you can't hire somebody and expect them to save you if you're not willing to put in some sort of an effort and either teach them or empower them to go learn too it's it, it's this myth that we have in in small business and entrepreneurship and it's just it's crazy i've seen it firsthand actually i remember you just brought back to mind my uh my first job ever i was like 13 or 14 and the owner of the business just wanted other people to make him money. And it yeah. was a disaster. Like nothing ever went well. They actually, that company ended up going bankrupt um, and, and closing because that's just not how you run and grow a business. So I, I love that you said, works. no, definitely not. Um, and, and I love that you've done it twice the right way. It's There's something to be said about that. So then let's let's look over now what you're doing. You said in your words, you were humbled when you started uh, Green Pal, which is, is interesting because yeah, it's a total different industry. It's a software product. You were in landscaping, and when you're you're tackling this project, I'm I'm sure there was some sort of that chip still on your shoulder. What what was that? Like, what was wrong with the industry that you you wanted to build this product now? Yeah, I so I I tried to kind of well, not retire because I was still I was only like 32 years old, so I was a young man. But but I tried to kind of live the good life almost, and I don't even know what that was supposed to be, but. I, I didn't want to go back to work every day and because it, it almost killed me running that first business and growing it to 150 people and then trying to get it acquired. It was really, really challenging. And so I didn't want to do that again, but I tried to take a year off and, and it got really existential very quickly that I didn't have a mission. Uh, there was no reason to, to like get out of bed in the morning and go crush it. And, you know, you can only do so much like passive investing and, and you can only do so much uh, real estate investing and things like that. And so I, I needed like an, uh, a reason, like to a the, the answer to the question, if, if I didn't get out of bed today, why would it matter? And if it wasn't for me, like then what? And, and so I thought, well, what, what should I do? And, 
and to, to your earlier point about movies, I, I had watched the movie The Social Network, and and like that was a really cool movie, uh, and it was very inspiring to me that that these kids could build something that touched millions of people, and and you know, ninety nine percent of that movie is probably dramatized a BS. Uh, it was still a really neat to see that, and I thought, well, what if I could do that in some small way in this in this world that I know, this blue collar world that I know. Because I saw running a landscaping business every single day how difficult it was for homeowners that needed a basic service to get connected with smaller service providers. Because as I grew that business to be a big company, we no longer did residential services. We no longer did the twenty the twenty nine dollar lawn mowing, but people would still call our office every day, hundreds of them. Hey, will you come mow my yard? Will you come? And we would have to like refer them to smaller service providers. So in effect, we were kind of like this analog referral service. And and so I knew that an app could do that much quicker, much easier, much more efficient. And and so I thought, well, somebody's going to build it. It might as well be me. And I knew it was going to be hard. I just didn't know, like, didn't know, I didn't know what I didn't know. And and I guess that was good because if I'd known how challenging it was going to be, I never would have done it in a million years. But I made a decision that, that I guess, well, I tried to kind of like hang it up. And I, I guess from now on, no matter what, I'm going to work on my best idea, whatever that is. And, I, and so in conjunction with that, I'm not terribly creative. I don't have a whole lot of good ideas hanging around. I've had one good idea in 10 years, and that is an app should exist where you should be able to hire a lawn mowing service in 60 seconds, even if your grass is four feet tall. That was the one good idea. And I've been working on that for a decade. And, and so I, I thought, well, let's just, let's just start working on it. And the first, the first year we got nowhere. And, and then like the second year, you know, we, we set a goal to try to get a hundred people to use it. That ended up taking two years. And then, it, and then so it was like four years before we, we, we launched our second market. And then I think it was five years before we had our third market. Um, and then maybe six years before we had a thousand people using it. So it was a very, very slow build. Um, but because I had made the decision personally that, you know, it doesn't, I don't care how long it takes. I'm just going to work on this until we can get it working. And I, and I also had, had seen that, you know, the numbers were small, but they were growing. And, and that if we could just, if compounding would just take hold, you know, 100 would be 200, 200 would be 400. And I knew it was just only a matter of time admittedly what I thought would take two years ended up taking 10, but what the hell else was, was I going to do? I, I, I had made a decision. I was going to work on my best idea. So that clarified a lot of my thinking and it eliminated a lot of bright, shiny object syndrome. Which I think most people lack, they lack that clarity and focus. And that's why most companies stop at whatever point they stop. That's where they stay. Whether the, right. they, they get sold or they close or they go out of business, everything starts to look like a good idea, but most people lack that focus. So um, I'm just curious because you've you've done this before. You've grown a massive company. You've sold it. This one, you're 10 years in, and it seems like you have a lot of traction with 300,000 users. You're nationwide. Um, first of all, do you have a plan to go internationally or is this just the United States? Yeah, ultimately, so when we started this, you know, I wanted to build something, my, my co-founders and I both, because they, 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 the reason I recruited them as co-founders, they had a chip on their shoulder, just like I did, that we all wanted to build something that could touch the mass market. And, and, you know, you mentioned when we, when we, when we started the, the podcast, man, I've never heard of this thing. And so that's what we're trying to fix now. It's like, we're the most world's most unknown known. And so or most known unknown. We, we, we need to fix that in terms of it should be in the default way that you get things done. Just like Instacart, DoorDash, uh, Uber, Airbnb, it should be in the like the default list of, of, of ways that you do certain things. And so that's what we're going after. And so it, it, it probably is smart to stay in the United States and still we, until we solve that problem. And 300,000 users is a drop in the bucket for how much grass is getting cut uh, in the United States. And so we have a long way to go, but ultimately, yeah, we want to be in Canada, UK, Australia, maybe in the next five years, we'll, we'll, we'll figure that, that out. But we, uh, we, we have 300 cities that, that we kind of measure. And there's a weird thing where every, every single one of them is kind of their own market. And, uh, we'll drive more transactions in a small city like Knoxville, Tennessee, 
than we will in a big city like Seattle, Washington. And so figuring out the nuances of those individual networks and why some uh, spin faster than others is one of the main things that, that we have to kind of figure out and work on. And until we figure that out, there's no reason to go international. But um, that, that's one of the challenges of running a, a network like this is, is, is each individual town is its own network. Yeah, that, I mean, that makes sense. And um, I ask partly because we have a we have a very large Australian and New Zealand audience. Oh, nice. Podcast, which we love you. We love our Kiwis out there. Go New Zealand. But um, uh, as far as the United States, it, it makes complete sense. And I hear what you're saying. 300,000 sounds like a big number, but the population of this country is 330 million. So there's there's obviously a ways to go. And uh, it, it's not that I haven't heard of your company because I don't respect it and I don't like what you're doing. I'm very particular about who I let touch my grass. So there you go. Uh, I, nice. I don't know if I'm going to be using it in just full, full transparency. I love nice. cutting my grass. It's it's my hobby on the weekends. Um, I, I will definitely it. check it out. And, and I put it on the screen here too. It's in the show notes, wherever you're watching or listening, go check out greenpal.com. See if you can find a, a reliable landscaper. Cause I know all, all of the trades, but particularly this one, anywhere I've lived in the country, I hear a lot of complaints about reliable landscapers. So why don't you go to a trusted source, make your life easier. Um, so I, I got one last question for you. And that is just, you have this aggressive growth brand. You, you want to continue to grow in the States, in these smaller markets, in all markets in general. How do you see yourself and your company getting to that million mark in, in whatever time timeline you've established? Like what are the things that you absolutely need to do as the owner and the founder to put in place for that to be possible? Yeah, one thing we have to get better at is uh, understanding our own data around how do we leverage the product to drive more positive interactions between buyers and sellers. And one thing we're working on is is one thing we call the uh, uh, an instant book feature. So if you remember way back in the old days of Airbnb, if you wanted to book uh, somebody's house or somebody's spare bedroom, you would be like this this ping pong thing where where you would say, hey, is it available? And they would say, uh, and they would look at your profile picture. And they're like, eh, no, it's not available. <laughs> you know, or maybe, uh, you know, it'd be like this weird, like back and forth thing. Yeah. Uh, and and uh, I remember it because I, 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 that's how it was. And now, now you can like instantly book uh, on Airbnb. And mm -hmm. so with GreenPal, it's still a bid system. And so, uh, as a homeowner, you, you sign up, you're like, and you say, okay, this is my yard. This is the square footage. And then contractors around you compete over that mm -hmm. and you get five bids in like 60 seconds. And then you, and then you come back and you hire one of them. And, um, that's very efficient. It's a lot more efficient than doing it the old way, but still it'd be nice to just download the app and say, Hey, here's five contractors that will definitely be there on Thursday in your zip code for $37. And they've committed to that. And we know with 100% certainty that they'll be there. Just hire one of them now. You don't have to wait five minutes. And so that's what we're working on, uh, using massive amounts of data, past transactional data, and being able to predict which which contractors can fulfill that. And uh, so we feel like that, that'll be a huge tipping point for us. It's just going to take a lot of work to get there. That's cool. That sounds like a big project. Um, it sounds like a lot of uh, a lot of numbers nerds are going to be very helpful on that. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, numbers nerds working on who would have thought lawn mowing, but hey, yeah, you know, right. That's that's that making making people's lives a little bit more convenient, but more importantly, helping these small business owners make more money is what we're here for. Yeah, no, that that's awesome. That that's such a cool trajectory. If you're numbers nerds, reach out. Maybe maybe there's a job for you at Green Pal. Reach out to Brian. Brian, thank you so much for coming here and sharing your story. This was fantastic. Brandon, I appreciate it, man. Thanks for having me on. All right, and you listening out there, first and foremost, if you have a lawn and you don't love cutting it as much as I do, you go to greenpal.com. It's in the show notes. It's wherever you are. Second thing I need you to do is subscribe, of course, because I love bringing these episodes to you every single day. This bite-sized business advice and these success stories. I do it for you, the listener, and we are here to inspire you to grow your business. And who knows, maybe you're the next success story that comes on this show and has a 150 employee company that they sold for a, a significant figure. So keep watching, keep listening. We're here for you. We'll see you on the next episode of Harmony.